So, um, I have a confession to make uh, that this particular sermon, um, I, I struggle with this one. So, um, this one's a bit of work for me too. So, um, but this sermon is, is entitled, God Fix My Face. God Fix My Face. And I, I've been trying to be conscious of you know, when I go different places, how my face looks, how my aura appears. And uh, I don't do well with that. Um, oftentimes, years ago, people used to tell me when I'm in the pulpit, you know, because you guys are always facing me, uh, people look at my face and they can tell what's going on with me. So I'm either irritated, or, ooh, Pastor Chair don't like that, ooh, the sound is bad, ooh, somebody just came in, ooh, you can tell everything about what's going on with me by looking at my face. And so I struggle with this, but I learned something about me and that part of the reason I don't always have this bright, jubilant face is because 90% of the time I'm thinking intensely about something, I'm concentrating on something, or I'm working on something, I'm always, my mind is turning, my wheels are turning. So when my wheels turn, my face turns. And so I'm like this. It can be construed as being uh, mean or in a bad place or whatever. Nonetheless, it doesn't give off the right vibe. Regardless of what it means to me, um, it still projects a particular perspective. So we're going to get to the text in a second. I'll get to the text. Um, but I want to kind of build upon this, this concept of understanding what the Bible says about face about your faces and so when you talk about fixing your face haven't you ever told your your kids you know, fix your face right <laughs> fix your face in other words project a different aura a, a position and so this fascinated me um and and helped me really kind of um come to s s uh, grip with some some things with myself but in the old testament in and in the bible face simply means presence. It means presence. Um, it's in the Old Testament in Genesis where Adam and Eve hid themselves from the face of God or from the presence of God. So if you say you're hiding from the face of God, you're hiding from his presence. The term for um, face in the Hebrew is panim, which means God's face. And God's face means his presence. It means his presence. So, so listen to this carefully. So when you talk about God's face, you're talking about God's presence. Got it? So write this down. Whatever face you have is what is present. Whatever face you have is what is present. You tracking? So if God's face means his presence, then my face, my projection means that's what I'm bringing to the table. I'm bringing that face, that presence to that arena. There's also a face that's made when you're in the presence of majesty or awe. OK, so your face can take a different change. What does your face look like when you see something amazing or astounding? Make that face. Can you make that? Right, like, all right, that face is amazing, right? Um, uh, and there's just something about when you are in front of majesty or royalty, you know that's not the time to play, right? It's not the silly, funny play. It's, it's a face that, that gives respect. Tracking? So for the Hebrew, the term for face is panim. For the Greek, it's prosopon, prosopon. Um, and it could refer to like the front of something. When you talk about facing something, you say, turn the thing to face me, right? So understand that when you're talking about the face you make, you're talking about being in front of somebody. Watch this, it's going to build to make sense. So <clears throat> if we have the face, um, uh, the right face, then we are to face people, to be in front of them as an outward appearance. The face, of course, also gives visible indication of inward emotions, right? If I'm angry, give me an angry face. What's an angry face? Mm, some of y'all did that too quick and easy. Y'all did too quick and easy, right? 
So you have angry faces, you have happy faces, you have, um, you know, ashamed faces, tearful faces, blushing faces. So all of those, I can tell your emotions by looking at your face. So modesty or reverence is demanded, uh, demanded the veiling of the face as did Rebecca before Isaac. So God's face um, in, in the Old Testament, sometimes there was such a reverence, such a majesty that the face had to be covered, had to be covered with a veil. Do you know why a woman wore a veil uh, during uh, weddings? They don't do that much anymore, but um, the reverence demanded the veiling of the face of the woman, that the man was to have such um, a reverence that the veil was symbolic of respect and honor for the reverence or not only just the man, but the presence of God in holy matrimony. Are you tracking? Okay, that would be a whole nother lesson to teach that. So I see you're curious about that, but um, I don't have the time to go there. But nonetheless, I want you to understand that reverence sometimes or uh, can cause for, call for a veiling. And there are all kinds of different veils. So for instance, in the temple, uh, there were three arenas. There was outer court, inner court, and then the most holy place. And between the most holy place and the inner place was a veil, right? So the veil protected the place of majesty or reverence or holiness. You tracking? So God's face might not be seen by man for fear of death. Exodus 33 and 20 said that, uh, thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. So people couldn't look at God's face and live. That's level one. So I'm trying to get you to see the intensity of his greatness, that God was, his aura, his holiness, his demeanor was so hot, so powerful, you could not look into his face and remain alive. Now, Here's what I got to get you to see. We got to take this journey. So, so follow me. I've got to get you to see how people see God and meet God. Nobody can look and see him. Right. So if we are representatives of him, how is it that people can look at our faces now and see God? So I got to get you from people can't look at God directly. They got to go through something. They're going to go through us, which means our face then becomes the picture out there. All right. So you still with me? So you know how uh, uh, companies buy faces, right? They buy celebrities. They buy their face to be the brand for them, right? So, so uh, people don't just don't buy Nike because of going into Nike. They buy Nike because LeBron or somebody else, a celeb, a face wears it. Are you tracking? So there's a go between, right? Nobody's just going to go up into the building, Nike, because Nike, the building is not impressive. The swoosh is the swoosh, but who wants to go to Nike building? But if I can associate what I'm going to get with Michael Jordan or a celebrity or a face, I'll engage. You tracking? All right. So metaphorically, watch this. Determination could be shown by setting one's face. Have you ever heard um, the text Isaiah 50? But you've heard it before. Set your face like Flint. Set your face like Flint, meaning you, you, not Flint, Michigan. Not, not Flint, Michigan. Yeah. I know we got some bias. When you heard Flint, whoop, 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 antennas all went up, right? Yeah, no, not Flint, Michigan. It, it means it denotes an unswerving purpose. In other words, you set your face to something. In other words, you set your face like Flint means I'm locked in on you, right? I'm locked in on you. I'm, I'm unswerving. I'm, I'll, I'll be undaunted. I'm going to be committed to pursue, to persevere through whatever that my face can be set like Flint. In other words, my presence is 
unswerving. If I'm in this, what do you say? If you're going to be in it, be in it, right? So your face can project that level of commitment. You following me? So determined opposition. Um, lastly, you know, you could say the face can show determined opposition, which is you say, um, I withstood him to their face. Right. Or you say we went at it face to face or you did that right in front of my face. Right. That means you did that right in front of me. I'm trying to get you to see that face can be equivalent to the presence, to being there, that the face that we think of eyes, nose, lips, you know, whatever the face can be equated to what you bring into the room. Me, the face can be connected to me. Isn't it interesting that four of the five senses are found on the face? Ah. So, so watch this then. Uh, you can also say uh, in Genesis, there's a place in, in Genesis 4 where it says that Cain's face fell. You've heard people say, oh, my face just dropped. My face just dropped. What does that mean? That means your countenance fell. That means, ooh, heaviness. Ooh, that was so big. I, ooh, that fell. That fell on me, right? So you could say that someone's demeanor or their countenance changed, their face fell. Just trying to build this case. So when we get to 2 Corinthians 3, it's going to help you make the spiritual connection, all right? So I'm just doing a little work here, just trying to put in a little work for you so, you know, Pastor Chair, don't just be coming up here in the morning. Um, so there's also that you can. Th this is a good one. You can lift someone's countenance. You can lift someone's face uh, by granting them favor. You can grant them favor by lifting one. So in other words. When I encourage somebody, when, when you do something nice for somebody, when you do something favorable for them, what happens to their face? You lift their face, right? So the face can be, the face can be lifted. Listen, so if the face is connected with me, I can be lifted. I can be lifted and encouraged by an act of favor. Uh, watch this. So if I walk with my face up, then it could be an indication that I'm walking in favor. Uh, watch this. Uh, uh, help me. So, so if God smiles on me, if God grants me favor, then my face ought to project God's blessing. I said I struggle with this. I, I, I admit it. Front street that I have to be conscious of what is my aura? Does it project that God is doing anything with me? Because remember, we're going to see it later that people will see God through your face. I'm trying to tell you that the entryway to God is your face. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. So God fixed my face, right? Why? Why do we want him to fix his face, fix our face? So that people can see him through us. Because all this, this week we had, all this, don't raise your hand, and don't tell on yourself, but, but all this, this, this morning, all this last night, who, who's coming to God behind that? Who? Who? You understand what I'm saying? So in the New Testament, the Greek term prosopon denotes God's countenance in an anthropomorphic expression, sort of God's lifting his countenance means his grace and peace. So watch this. So when God is happy, when God's countenance is up, he's up, right? Which means... There's an abundance of grace and there's abundance of peace. There's an abundance of favor. There's an abundance of blessing. So if there is no downtime with God, then there is no downtime with grace, peace, blessing, and favor. God, uh, 
We're the ones who struggle with the expression of our face, the up and down. You've been on the roller coaster ride of in a relationship or with Christianity or with trying to do the right thing, trying to quit smoking, trying to quit drinking, trying to quit whatever it is you're trying to quit. You've been on that roller coaster, right? God doesn't experience that. Do you understand what I'm saying? So he doesn't love you one day and hate you the next. We do that. You know, we tight this week. Can't stand you tomorrow. You know what I mean? Love my job this week. Hate this place next week. You understand? Because we have this topsy-turvy relationship. And all I'm saying is God fix my face to be able to show the consistency of the God who is consistent in me. You tracking? So if he constantly exudes mercy, grace, favor, forgiveness, blessing, then you have the opportunity to always have uptime to forgive your sister, to help your brother, to be a blessing to your neighbor, to always be able to demonstrate that. Are you tracking? <sighs> so your face can shine. God's face can shine on us. And when his face is shining on us, then we should reciprocate that to the world and shine that light. Are you understanding? So we've heard it before that if God hides his face, if God turns his face from you, that means that he is he has he has separated himself from yours, withdrawn his grace from you. He's, in other words, withdrawn his favor, which means he has he has somehow become displeased with your actions or your life. And he has, in some sense, turned his face to you. You want God's face facing you at all times, smiling on you, shining on you so that you can be in a constant flourishing state of growth and development. Does that make sense? We've seen it in the Old Testament where God turns his back on a city or turns his back on the enemy or whatever. He turns his face from this. And, and so bad things happen. All right. I told you to write down uh, the first thing, which was whatever face you have is what is present. So write this second one down. If we can do better with our face, then we can do better with our witness. If we can do better with our face. We can do better with our witness. Amen. That's a that's a good one. Right. It, it's true. People are going to be more inclined to engage with me if I look approachable. Right. If I if I look like a, a mean old Henri pistol, uh, nobody wants to engage with me. So we've got to learn and get to a place where we are actually fixing our face. Why? Because it invites, it invites people to see God. Who wants to see an angry God? Who wants to see a God who crying every day, all day, stressed and worried? Who, how are you? Oh, Lord, I'm just stressed, man. I whoo, can't make it. Who, you know, you may have your moments, but, but there ought to be more God up times than, than bad times. All right. So let me I'm going to I'm going to show you three things here as we go through this text. I want to I want to point out how how God's listen, we're going to go from God's face shining that no man could look on it. Right. So I'm going to take you from understanding that God's face is the ultimate face. That is the face that nobody can look on. So if that's true, watch this. This is pivotal. If no one could look at his face, then he had to learn how to reveal himself through words. Uh, watch this. Watch this. If you can't. So. So in other words. So. So look. So if you can't look at me, then I'll stand behind a veil. I'll get behind a curtain and I'll speak to you like the Catholic priest. You come to confession. You speak through the curtain. I'll talk to you through the curtain. In other words, you can't see me. But you can. So what does God do? Watch this. This is transitional. This is all still backdrop. So so God then transitions from his people not being able to see his face to giving Moses the Ten Commandments. 
Get it? So he switches. <laughs> Woo! He switches from walking in front of Adam and Eve and being with his people to now giving them a set of laws which represent his face. So that being said, when Moses got the law, watch this, and we're going to see this in, in 2 Corinthians. So now Moses' face shines. Okay, we're going to read it in a second. So we go from God's face shining to giving it in the word to where then Moses' face starts shining because he holds the Ten Commandments. Tracking? Watch. Play it back for you. God's face shines. Nobody can look at it. So he gives the tablets, the Ten Commandments, to Moses to take to the people. So when Moses holds the tablets, guess what? His face shines. <laughs> Is this making sense? So as long as he holds the tablets... His face shines. So what happened? We then moved from the law, the Old Testament, to the New Testament. And Moses has passed the law, the word over into Christ. Christ comes as the living word who walks the earth. And of course, you saw him shining in glory. You know, people, the glory knocked men down. The Bible said when they came to arrest him, they fell out on the ground because his glory was so powerful. And so now what Christ has done when he went to the cross, he now gave us his word like God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Christ gave us the word. And when we carry the word in us, we shut. Woo! <laughs> so, fix your face. <laughs> because you carry God's word. <laughs> I think that I think you got it, right? I but <laughs> Uh, we could go home. Let's sing a song and go home, right? So, so l let me at least compliment that in, in, in Scripture. So 2 Corinthians 3, and, and I think it'll make more sense to you, and, and that's why I, I, I did the background first because it, it's just a lot. So watch this, verse 1. Do we begin, this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, do we begin to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation? To you or letters of commendation from you. Verse two, watch this. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So in other words, we're letters, we're written epistles, we're the word on display. Tracking? Verse three, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be what? The epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Here it is. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So you, you get it now? So God gave Moses stone in writing to bear the word. Now God has written, he has graphe, he has taken that written word, that semantic structure, and placed it in the dynamics of our hearts and said, you are now the written word on display. Woo. Do you understand what I'm saying? So at this point, it is not so much that we must walk around with a Bible to convey the truth, you must hide the word where? In your heart. Because that's where the shine comes from. 
doesn't come from your dusty King James version that you pulled off the shelf. It, it doesn't come from the sun tainted one you put in the back of your ride in the window to be on call just in case. Whether I have a Bible or not, I know enough scriptura, scripture inside of me to be able to speak the things of God to bring people to him. Ah, God, help me through here. I'm going to try to go fast. Verse four. So and such trust. Have we through Christ to God word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. So watch this. Everything that we present goes all the way back to God, the face who people cannot see. So in other words, our sufficiency is of God. Now watch this because this is big. Verse six. Who also hath made us. Listen to this. Able ministers of the New Testament. Do you see that? You're a minister of the New Testament. I just showed you. The Old Testament was Moses. We're the New Testament. We're the ministers of the New Testament. Our faces are supposed to shine. Now watch this. Verse six. Second part. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So in other words, not of the letter. The letter refers to the law. The Old Testament. The letter refers to the law. So we minister not according to the Old Testament law. And here's a scripture that tells you we don't follow the Ten Commandments. We don't follow the laws in the Old Testament, line for line, rule for rule. Like it said in the Old Testament, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Not true in the New Testament. Somebody poke you in the eye, God say forgive them. You get it? Old Testament says somebody poke you in the eye, poke them back in the eye. That's Old Testament. OK, eye for an eye, two for two. You stab me, I stab you. New Testament, they stab you. Don't do nothing. Now, there seems to be more power or more glory in that kind of response. I don't have time to teach you that today, but it's true. You actually are better off not getting back at the person than you are forgiving them. Woo. That's New Testament and it has a greater glory, which you're going to see in a second. So we don't minister by the letter because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So verse seven. But if the ministration, the ministry of death written and engraven on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. So watch this. Let's go back. Let's let, let's dissect seven. If the ministry of death, if the Old Testament led to death, written and engraven on the Ten Commandments, the stones that Moses was given, if that had glory, listen, what kind of glory? Glory to the point that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold Moses. In other words, they couldn't look on him and keep focusing on him. They might be able to look a little bit and then turn away. I'm trying to get you to see the intensity has been brought down so that people can reach and see God. I'm trying to get you to see it, y'all. And, and they see them through your when people when you meet supposed to be when you meet people and you come in the door, they're supposed to look at your face. Right. So depending on watch this. And I think it has a lot to do with depending on how you dress, what you accentuate draws the attention. So part of the modesty in dressing was not so much we just not trying to let you show your curves, but we're trying to get people to focus on the most important place, which is your face. If you're going to fix anything up or accentuate anything, Thank you, God. Woo! Accentuate your face. And the face that I'm talking about, and I took a 20 minutes to explain, is not just this physical face, but your spiritual face, your aura, your presence when you walk in the room. Are people delighted to even see you? You've heard people when they walked in the room, they lit up the room. Right? Because, because their face, their face, their face is beautiful. 
And I was at the counter last night. I was at the counter last night, and I recognized I was just frowning, 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 frowning. And I, I fix your face. What are you frowning about? What? And it's not that I was frowning. I was looking at the, the receipt, was trying to count, <laughs> and it had, it had me focused. I was intense, but it could give off the wrong. You're a mean old man. I remember I saw this lady once and and, you know, they say you make a face long enough that mom used to say your face going to turn that way. And it was like she had her eyes were like, you know, so pointed. She had to put her eyeliner on. It just went shoo, like that. It was she had she couldn't even her face had taken on that. So she had to do the liner to match it because that's the way her face. Looked. In other words, you can start looking in that project. And so that's the concept that we ought to see that God is so good to us on a regular basis. There ought to be a constant aura of shine. <sighs> Am I talking to anybody? But I don't want you to I want you to understand. Verse seven said that Old Testament has some glory with it. It had, that it came with some glory. So look at verse eight. Verse eight says, how shall. In other words, if 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 the Old Testament had glory, verse eight says, how shall not the ministry of the spirit be rather glorious? In other words, the, what, your ministry is going to have more impact. It's going to have more glory than Moses with the Old Testament. Who you big time? You big time, Tia. You big time. You run. You you carrying around a glory that's that's bigger than than what the Old Testament. Do you do you get what I'm saying? What you possess in you is bigger, is better, more glorious than Moses. Woo! You big time, but can't tell it from your face. You understand what I'm saying? So so verse number eight. Verse number nine, for if the ministry of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministry of righteousness exceed in glory. So in other words, if if the Old Testament is because the people, the reason the Old Testament led to death, because the people couldn't keep the law. Again, that's the fact. That's the problem. The problem with looking at God's face, people couldn't look at him and live. You understand what I'm saying? The problem with the Old Testament is that people couldn't look at the law and keep it. The problem. So so now we're in the New Testament, which we can't find any problem with because Christ fixes everything for us. So the way people come to God is through Christ. Disclaimer here, just going to insert, throw this in here, paragraph insertion, uh, word, new paragraph. Let's open this up. This is one of the biggest contentions. When we begin to look at other religions, other religions that do not necessarily have a place for Christ. This passage could help to argue if people can't get to God by going straight through him, if people can't get to God by going through the Old Testament, then how will people get to God? Do you get it? So the argument for Christianity is he gets to God through Christ. So St. John 14 says, no man cometh unto the father, but by me. So the problem with other religions, when you talk about Confucius or Buddha or Gandhi or any other prophet, the problem is you can't get to God through them. You get it? Now, you can get positives out of Buddha. You can get positives out of Confucius. You can get positives out of reading Dianetics and other Scientology and, and uh, Jehovah Witness and other religions. You can get uh, life changes and you can get positive uh, act right. You get, it can help you stop smoking and dancing. and part. It can do all kinds of positive things for you. But it will not kill your sin. And that's the ticket. Because the only way you're going to get to heaven is if your sins have been forgiven. And only God forgives sins. And God came in the person of Christ to forgive sin. And he's the only one who can do it. Buddha can't forgive sin. Sorry, no offense. Confucius. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad can't do it. 
Anybody else cannot eradicate sin. You send emails and questions to info at Pastor Cherry, all the hate mail. Send the anger. Send it to the email. I will not read it. I'll just delete it. No, I'm just kidding. No. Do, do you understand what I'm? Was that helpful? I, I just had to take an extra minute to explain that. So verse 10, verse 10 says, for even, even that which was made glorious had no glory in respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. In other words, it, it had no glory compared to, to the glory we have. It excels far beyond. Verse 11, for if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remain is glorious. So in other words, the Old Testament faded away. It, it went away. The, the glory faded from Moses because that's not how it, it was going to work. Verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. In other words, we're bold about it now. So seeing that that's the case, seeing that we have such hope, knowing that God is with us, we're bold and we're plain in speech. So like we, our sermon two weeks ago, dramatic words, you, you, you got to get your words together, be able to express the message. Verse 13, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded for until this day remains the same veil Untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away. How? In Christ. So for everyone who's stuck in the Old Testament, who won't accept the New Testament, the Bible says the veil remains. That veil is removed when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? That's pretty plain. I don't think I need to go to that. Verse 15. Uh, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the heart. Moses referring to the Old Testament law. When the Old Testament, the veil is upon the heart. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So watch this. So if you read the Old Testament, you're veiled. Your heart is veiled. But when you turn to the Lord, when you turn to the New Testament, when you turn to Christ, what happens? The veil comes off. Got it? Now it gets juicy. Now it gets juicy. Now the Lord is that spirit. Okay, so wait a minute. So watch this. So the Bible said, when you turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away, right? So if people turn to the Lord, what do they turn to? They don't see a physical Jesus, do they? No. So the, the Lord, the next verse said, the Lord is the spirit, is that spirit. So people turn to the Lord by turning to the spirit, which spirit lives in you that you are supposed to present to the world. So when people turn to the spirit in me, their veil comes off. <laughs> so, so, watch it. so if I fix my face, my spirit, my aura, then People have the opportunity to be unveiled. And guess what? Bing! Oh, oh, uh, they be able to be able to see God. <laughs> Woo, break this down, Pastor Chair. Break it down. Break it down. Woo, my baby, my mate. My baby, my mate. Uh, all right, verse <laughs> Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit, because watch this, I feel this, Sharon, I feel it. Ah, the, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, uh, what is it, y'all? Come on, read the text. Where the spirit is, there is liberty. It uh, sets people free when, when I'm in the right aura, when I'm in the right space, when I'm, when I'm in the right frame of mind. I, I have the potential to not only liberate people, but to liberate myself. Ah, oh, God. And so where the truth is, the, the truth will set you 
free. God, come on. So God says, woo, he says, I'm going to open this up. I think he's broadening. People say Christianity is narrow, but I think the gate is real wide because God said, in other words, instead of leaving the restriction for people to come to me straight through me by looking at me where they can't, they're going to die by trying. I'm going to give them the Old Testament, try to get them to me, let Israel follow me, but they messed up with that too. That didn't work, so I got to open up the restriction a little more. And so he opened the restriction, says, all right, not through Moses, but now through Jesus. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Woo! I think that's a wide gate, right? Whosoever, whomsoever <laughs> shall call upon the name of the Lord. Shelby, better get in while you can. Get in while getting is good, right? You better get in while getting is good. And that's my point. Fix your face because the world is going to hell in a handbasket and you are the light. Amen. I know you got enough stuff to cry about. I know you got enough stuff to be stressed and complain about. I know you do. But put people going to hell above your personal preferences. Amen, lights. You don't have to shout on that one. Put God's will above your own personal comfort and say the reason we got to get this damn thing together is because people are going to hell. Excuse my language for a second, but I wanted to have emphasis on that to help you understand that there are people who need change out there and we're fighting in here. The nerve of us in the church to be fighting. Well, you can't wear that and you can't do that and you can't sing this and you can't park there. And that's my seat and I called this and I'm the founder of it. I dedicated this. My daddy started it. You can't do this. And I'm on the deacon board. I'm the HNIC here. All of this foolishness while people are going to hell out there. And I'm going to say to every deacon, I'm going to say to every preacher, I'm going to say to every nurse or deaconess or missionary, fix your face. Ah, <sighs> oh, God, let me wrap this up. Verse number 18 says, and this is the crescendo of it all. I love him for this. He says, but we all with open face. We all, everybody, right? That, that's everybody. We all, uh, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. Do, do you understand? We, 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 we look into this glass, into the glory of the Lord. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So watch this. So when Moses carried the New Testament, he shined, right? So the Bible says that as we, as we look into that glass, as we look into the glass of the glory of the Lord, in other words, when we look at the glory of the Lord, what's the glory of the Lord? The glory of the Lord is the word. God is the word. The New Testament was the word. The Old Testament was the word. The New Testament is the word. So when we look into that glory, when we behold the glory, watch this, the Bible says we are changed from, watch this, from glory, the word, to glory as an escalated transformation to be able to, watch this, to be able to take that light, that glory into our lives and present that in the world. And how is it done? We're changed how? By the spirit of the Lord. God's spirit changes me. And so Romans 8 says he's committed to conforming us to the image of his son. You're going to miss it. So John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The Bible says later on in verse 14, says the word came, became flesh and dwelt among us. Watch this. So that the glory came walking on, 
walking on earth. Watch this. Uh, uh, so, so God transferred the glory to Moses, right? And Moses transferred it down to Christ. Uh, and then Christ transferred it down to so that watch this so that as I look into that word the more I read that word guess what I'm changed I fix my faith oh come on you're gonna miss it you're gonna miss it the more I read the word the more glory gets on my life and I've had people come in church and say to me pastor Cherry, I don't know I don't know what happened but I saw this light above you I saw this halo around they've said it more than once and it's been different people and it's been at different settings I know it's true I don't doubt it I, it ain't me it's the word of God it's the glory of God it's the word of his presence it's the feeling of his temple it's the point of God coming in the room. Haven't you read Isaiah 6 where the glory of the Lord filled the temple and his train followed behind him and the angels and so much so that Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm an undone, unclean man. And the coals of fire had to touch his lip to clean him up to the point where he could say, here am I, Lord, send me. Ah, when you get in the presence of the Lord, there's repentance that takes place. You start changing. You start confessing. You don't have time to judge other people. That's how I know godly people Godly people don't judge. Godly people are too busy working on them. I got stuff I prayed about this morning. Do you understand me? I don't have time to be analyzing you and dissecting you like I did the pig and the frog and the fly in school. But I have to dissect myself because I'm being changed. You may not like it. You might be a hater because you're not changing yourself. But I'm changing. Every time I go to the word, I get an overhaul. Every time I go to the word, I get my carburetor rebuilt. Every time I go to the word, I get a fan belt. Every time I go to the word, I get an oil change. Every time I go to the word, I get a light bulb change. That word is transforming me. Amen. Amen. Woo! Tell him, Deacon. Tell him. Tell him, Gator. So we got to understand that we are changed from glory to glory. Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me just show you this real quick as we wrap this up. Let me just show you this. This is beautiful. Second Corinthians chapter four, look at verse three. Watch this because I'm going to bring you home on this. Verse four said, but verse three started verse three. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> I would do everything I can to shine, <laughs> but it's not my responsibility to convert you. <laughs> That's God's job. My job is to just show up and shine a little bit. The Bible said that if they miss it, it's because they've been blinded and they are lost. Verse 4 said, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Why? Unless the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God should shine through unto them. Ah, that's what the devil tries to do. He tries to put so much junk, gunk on you so they can't see the real God. That's why the devil tries to put confusion between you and your best friend or you and your husband because all it is is a veil. It keeps you from seeing what God wants you to see. That's why forgiveness will clear the scale from your eyes have you ever woke up with sleepy eyes what's the first thing you do wipe your eyes clear them out I came to tell somebody you better go home and spiritually clear your eyes clear your marriage clear forgiveness forgive your friends don't be upset and bitter and angry at your boss and at stuff that you ain't got no control over why because it's keeping you from seeing what God wants you to see. God wants to transform you and show you the real good stuff. When we gonna get to the good part, good part, when you start forgiving people who have wronged you unjustly, when you start showing patience in patient settings, when you start overlooking people who have wronged you and you end up blessing them in spite of, that's when the good 
good part comes. I don't know about you, but are you ready for a blessing? Are you ready for a miracle? I'm talking, I'm not talking about a benzo. I'm talking about the miracles that come, that when you lay hands on somebody, something changes inside of them. Blood flows up, stuff tightens up, stuff strengthens and lengthens. People get stabilized. People are able to think again. Hallelujah. People stop smoking and drinking and doing crack. When you start praying for people with the real glory, stuff happens. Woo! I don't want to be another preacher who just shows up at the hospital to pray. I want to show up to the hospital and pray and something changed. I'm looking for a phone call. Either they got up or they died or they transitioned or something because there's got to be something that God does when you have his glory. Mm. Let me show you this so you can understand where you are in your life. Go down to verse number six. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined where? In our hearts. Why? To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Verse number seven said, but we have this treasure. Where? In earthen vessels. Why? So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. In other words, God purposely put something so astounding in something so unfathomably broken. So it's evidently clear that the power you're living with cannot come from your own flesh. It's got to be God. If I'm still standing, it's got to be God. And can I close you with this on this? If you look at verse number eight, I think God intentionally does this. So here's what he says. Paul makes it clear to make the glory stand out more. Guess what? Verse 8 says we're troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. Always bearing about where? Where? In the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. In other words, God God purposely lets me be troubled on every side. God purposely let me be cast down. God purposely let me be perplexed. In other words, he let me have some serious situations so he could show up and say, this couldn't have been nothing but God. He wants you limping out of it. He wants you broken out of it. He wants you snotting and crying out of it. Why? So you can give the glory to God so that you don't come out saying yeah I prayed my way through yeah I went to class and got my degree yeah I told them this and I did that no God let you get stomped on pillaged used isolated ostracized so you get flat on your face oh there it is ah oh, flat on your face for the reverence and the glory of God he'll break you all the way down till you get prostrate to the point where no one can deny that the results of your life is the result of God's glory. Mm. Hallelujah. 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 Verse number 14 said, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you for all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might be through the thanksgiving of many redound how to the glory of God so when Jesus got raised up we gonna get raised up don't worry about the wrong that's done to you the point is God's gonna elevate you as well Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Let it work itself out in you. Is that all right? Amen. Let the bad be the bad so God can get the glory. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Amen. 
This sermon started by me going into the mirror in the bathroom. And, you know, I had my hair cut, thought I was looking all good. And so then I made this ugly face. And I, did, I don't even remember what the face was. And something hit me like a stirring missile. And it said, a pretty face can make an ugly face. And I thought, hmm. So that means something pretty can actually be ugly. <laughs> ah, and, and it gave me to think about the face and the panim, the presence of God. And I was thinking that I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care how much makeup, how much uh, money you got, how many suits you buy, I don't care how much, whatever it is, you can be ugly if you don't have the face of God. So the Spirit said, Brother Cherry, knock that other sermon off your list. This is what I want you to preach. How do you get this sermon out of a stupid face in the mirror? Where does this context, this is meat word right here. This is meat word. Where do you get that from? From making a stupid face in the mirror. It shows you that you have to have an awareness of God at all times. And you never know when he'll speak to you. Anytime is the right time for his face to show. And God's word to you is, fix your face.